right, more about experiments and how they can be used in psychology. All right, so previously, we set up the basics. You got to have an independent variable. You have to have a dependent variable. You have to have at least two groups for comparison. And all your groups are measured on the same dependent variable. Some other things to consider. For your experiment, just like with any quantitative study, studies that are based on measurements, numbers, statistics, in a quantitative study, it is very important that not only do you have to have a testable hypothesis, but the variables involved in your hypothesis have to be clearly defined. You cannot have vague, imprecise terminology that's going to interfere with the testability of your hypothesis. So you have to provide operational definitions for your variables. An operational definition is basically where you say, this is what I mean by this word I'm using when I say this variable, this is what I mean by that, and this is how I'm going to measure it. Measure it. That's a very important component. You have to state, how can you measure this variable? When you say depression, for example, what do you mean by depression? In particular, how are you gonna get a, a score? How are you gonna get a measurement of some sort? How are you gonna get data that indicates how much depression someone has or whether they have depression? Because you can do it two ways. You can do how, what amount or you can do an either or sort of um, coding situation, but you have to be able to, to measure, to quantify your variables in some way. So an operational definition is a precise definition and it includes specification of how the variables will be measured. All right, sometimes one study, one experiment may have a different operational definition for a particular variable than another. All right, so one study may say, hey, we are studying anxiety. Our operational definition for anxiety is that you have to, uh, this is going to be based on a score on an anxiety inventory. People are going to fill out a self-report anxiety inventory. The higher the score, the more anxiety they have. That's one operational definition of anxiety. You might have another study that says, well, we're gonna do things a little differently. We are gonna have them go through a diagnostic interview with a clinical psychologist, and the clinical psychologist is gonna use the diagnostic and statistical manual to determine whether or not they have a clinically significant uh, anxiety disorder. You know, so that's different. That's a different way of measuring, marking. That's a different way of quantifying anxiety. Those are both operational definitions, definitions of anxiety. Whenever you are consuming, reading about research, it is important uh, to remember that you have to pay attention to what did the researchers mean by that particular uh, term. And if you go on to conduct any sort of research, you will have to specify what do you mean by that term and how you're going to measure it. Now, some other issues with experiments. All right, you have to set up your groups for comparison. Your goal is to compare those groups on the dependent variable. Well, is that comparison valid? I mean, because if they're different, you're going to say, well, they're different because of the independent variable. Well, is that always the case? The reality is there are other variables in the environment, in the world, within the person that can influence your results. We have to worry about what we call confounding variables. These are basically any external variables that are not part of your particular study or hypothesis, but can influence your results. And so um, it's a, any variable other than the independent variable that can have an impact on the dependent variable. Now, can you eliminate all confounding variables? Realistically, no, all right, but you wanna reduce as much as possible. This is why we often do things like standardizing, uh, things like instructions for experiments. We have things in controlled environments whenever possible to try to reduce confounding variables. Like, hey, at least everybody's being tested in the same room. Same instructions, same environment. So sometimes we just try to standardize things as much as possible to keep them consistent, keep them the same. But sometimes you can't eliminate confounding variables with standardization. And so sometimes you say, well, we have confounding variables. 
We can't eliminate them, but maybe let's at least make sure they are spread out roughly equally between our groups. So we do this thing called random assignment. With random assignment, anybody who participates in your study, anybody who signs up and participates in your experiment should have an equal probability of being in one group versus the other, right? There should be no system to, in terms of which group they end up in. So random assignment, you sign up for a study, you do not know if you're gonna be in the experimental group, the control group, high dose group, low dose group, it should be random which group you end up in. This roughly means that individual differences within your participants that can be confounding variables, they get spread out roughly equally between the, the, between the two groups. So random assignment is one of those things that's supposed to reduce the problems we have from confounding variables. All right, now how can we achieve random assignment? Um, a lot of times we use random number generators. Uh, you know, back in the old days, we used to do things like put people's name in a hat and choose from a hat which group they were in, or we would put their names on index cards and shuffle the cards. But now you can use like Microsoft Excel or other programs to, to generate a list of random numbers and you can sort your list of participants by the random numbers. There are various ways you can do it. Things you don't want to do because it wouldn't be random assignment. You don't want to say, okay, the first 50 people who show up, they're in the experimental group. The next 50 who show up, they're in the control group. That is not random at all because then there are going to be differences between the two groups. Like the early birds are in that first group that you assigned to. You know, you're not going to have any early folks in the second group. You also don't want to do things like, okay, well, you know, people... Uh, people with these last names uh, in the alphabet, you know, like people with names in the early part of the alphabet, they'll be in the experimental group. And then the rest of the alphabet, will put them in the control group. You don't want to do that sort of thing. That's not random assignment. Uh, you want to uh, shoot for random assignment to reduce problems from confounding variables. Now, um, another issue. I previously mentioned a placebo. Remember a placebo is like a fake independent variable or you, you think you're getting the independent variable but you really don't? Um, well, there is this thing called the placebo effect. Um, you can observe the placebo effect if you give someone a non-alcoholic beverage but lead them to believe that it is an alcoholic beverage. This is remarkably easy to do, and I saw this many times in my younger days. Uh, also, students will often tell me stories where someone got, you know, they thought they were getting something alcoholic, and they started acting like they had consumed alcohol. And then somebody's like, you know, that's non-alcoholic. They're like, oh, well, why was I acting like that? Placebo effect. This is when you act differently, not because of the actual effect of the independent variable. You act differently because of things like expectation, how you think you are supposed to act. Um, this is a phenomenon in which participants react as if they were receiving the actual independent variable. Humans do this. Humans will uh, change because they think they are supposed to change. Um, you know, we will have situations where you give someone a placebo pill and you say, how do you feel? They I feel better. It's like, well, why would they do that? Well, they think, well, hey, they're giving me a pill. It's supposed to do something. Surely I feel different in some way. And so how do we get around issues with placebo effects in experiments? What if your participants are acting differently because of some placebo effect? Well, one thing that you can do is you can uh, not tell them what group that they are in. You can use blinding in an experiment. And you can have single blind experiments and double blind experiments. With a single blind experiment, the participant does not know which group that they're in. They don't know if they're getting real, if it's a drug study. They don't know if they're getting a real drug or the placebo drug. Or you can also do a double blind study where even the researcher who they interact with, the member of the research team, that they interact with doesn't know what group they're in. Now you might be thinking, well, how are we gonna do that? Well, this is where you have more than one person uh, involved in the experiment. And so there's one person who's in charge of assigning people to groups and then, an, and then 
Another person is the person who actually interacts with their participants and they are not told who's in what group. So like if it's a drug study, they show up and the drugs are already sorted. They say here, give this one to participant number 387. They don't know if they're giving that participant placebo or actual drug. That way they don't treat the participants differently. That way they don't introduce bias from their behavior. All right, so these are things that can help can help with getting sort of what we call, we could say cleaner findings. Uh, another term is more valid findings, more valid findings from an experiment uh, when you use blinding techniques.